Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Gologoli. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. I'm a vice chairman at Columbia on the Board of Trustees, and it's an exciting day for us to talk with three of our leading thinkers about climate change. Today, we're going to talk about climate, the work being done at Columbia, which we think is unique around the world, and try to describe to you the quality and depth of the expertise that we have. Climate is clearly a broad and complex topic. And to deal with it effectively, we think one of the things we need to do is to be cross-disciplinary across the quality and character of our institution. We'll talk about that today. Understanding the scope of the problem requires an array of disciplines and array of perspectives. And I think today you'll see that we bring a number of perspectives to this topic, to this urgent problem. It's my great pleasure first to introduce uh, Lee C. Bollinger, the 19th president of Columbia, the longest serving president in the Ivy League. I'd say the most successful president in the Ivy League. Uh, Lee is the first Seth Lowe professor of the university, uh, a member of the law school faculty, and one of the United States' foremost First Amendment scholars. Lee, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Mark. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome, it's good to be here. It's a pleasure, really, I'd say. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Alex Halliday. Alex is the director of the Columbia University Earth Institute. He joined the Earth Institute in, the, in April 2018. Alex had spent more than a decade at Oxford, during which time he was the Dean of Science and Engineering. Alex, how are you today? I'm very good. It's great to be here and wonderful to see everybody and great to be talking to people about this topic. Maureen Ramo is the interim director of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She's the G. Unger Bettelson Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and she's the director of the Lamont Doherty Core Repository. An amazing place. If you have a chance, go out to Lamont Doherty and check out the Core Depository. It's sort of an astonishingly beautiful and interesting <clears throat> site that hopefully Maureen will give us a chance to talk a little bit about. Uh, she's a marine geologist and a climate scientist. Dr. Ramo focuses on the history and the causes of climate change in the past, including the consequences of climate change on sea level and on ice sheet stability. Maureen, good to see you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Glad to be here. I think I'll start the conversation by, by saying that, you know, when we think about climate, it's an immense problem. It's an immense problem. Uh, Alex and Maureen, you've spent your professional lives studying the problem and trying to understand its origin and ultimately what do we do about it now. T talk to us about how you even start to think about it and to explain it to people who don't spend their lives on it, people like me and other members of our audience. Maureen, do you wanna go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, you're absolutely right that it is an extraordinarily uh, multidisciplinary problem that impacts all facets of, of the physical, chemical, and biological earth. And, uh, and it's humbling in that way because you realize even after decades, you, you're expert in just a small part of the problem. Um, it's one of the reasons why Lamont has been so impactful over the years, because there's so many experts in so many diverse areas. And, and when they have that intersectionality between them, you know, we make great advances forward in thinking about this multidisciplinary problem. But you're right, it is humbling and um, it's a tough problem. Yeah, perhaps I'd uh, add that I think um, Columbia more broadly has got fantastic expertise to bring to this problem. Um, we build upon the expertise of Lamont in many respects, which is the biggest geoscience organization of its kind in any leading university in the world. And it's got long history for tackling these problems. But we've also got this amazing engineering school uh, that is seen as the fastest growing, most exciting engineering school in the Ivy League. Uh, and we've got wonderful people in public health, architecture, et cetera. And what you realize is that the climate problem is um, incredibly complicated and hard because it involves all these disciplines and more. 
And that's one reason why you need a top university like Columbia um, to be actually doing this work, because you need to actually be able to bring people together from across uh, a multidisciplinary organization. So let me pick this up. Um, uh, taking the question that Mark asked, and let me just say, I mean, nobody uh, that I know of in the world is more committed to doing something, many things about climate change than Mark. And it's fantastic to have him part of the Columbia community and on the board of trustees and as a friend. So, um, you know, sometimes in life there are very big problems, uh, but we essentially know what we need to know to, to deal with them. The problem is we don't have the political will uh, to deal with them, but it, it's not a matter of knowing more. It's, uh, it's getting things done. Here, it's a combination of both things, obviously. Uh, we have real problems in getting political action and societal action, international action. But you are both experts uh, in various dimensions of knowledge related to climate change. And I wonder if you could speak about, since eventually we'll get to universities here, uh, maybe very quickly, what is it that we don't know about climate change that we need to know and can know really through university research uniquely uh, Maureen, what, what would you say to that from your perspective? What is it that we need to know to help deal with the problems? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing that I worry about that we don't know is the potential for tipping points within the climate system. And most specifically, I'm thinking about the rate at which the polar ice sheets could melt. And uh, that's clearly, you know, the polar research programs at, at Lamont are, are, are large and deep. And, um, you know, the implications for cities and communities around the world are huge. Uh, what that rate of sea level rise could potentially be over the coming decades to centuries. And, you know, I always say what happens at the poles is not going to stay at the poles. It's going to show up, you know, on our doorstep. And, knowing what to plan for when you start putting in so you know solutions to cope with sea level rise knowing if it's going to be six inches or six feet by the end of this century it is such a vast difference and it's so important that we understand more about the ice sheets uh, let me come back to that alex what would you say uh, i think that's um a key issue um i think the the, the broader issues about how do we predict the future, I think are really important. We are fortunate because not only do we have Lamont, we've also got NASA GIS based here at uh, Columbia University, which for those of you who don't know, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies produces one of four um, uh, assessments of the temperature of the surface of the Earth. Uh, there's one in the UK, and there's one that's done by the Japanese, and NOAA does one as well. And uh, the NASA GIS one is the most comprehensive in terms of getting data. And that matters hugely because some parts of the Earth are warming up much faster than others, in particular the Arctic. And there's been scientific controversy as to why that is. And so the science itself um, is changing as we observe the climate system developing. And as such, there's a lot of fundamentally important new information to be acquired just about how the Earth is going to be changing in the future. That ex also includes things like wildfires, the ecosystems of forests and how they're going to be behaving. Uh, it includes what's been happening in terms of water resources, uh, where again, we've got great expertise here, uh, where drought is going to be a major problem uh, going forward. And then it also, uh, is to do with extreme events and how those will affect coastal cities like Mumbai, New York City, Miami, etc. Another, there's another one other side. I just want to quickly add to that, and that is there's a lot to be figured out about technology and solutions as well, and that's where strong universities can play a major role because you can lay out uh, in an intelligent way what it is we know about the future and what that will look like and then come up with engineering and architecture and, and uh, 
ecological solutions that will actually help to deliver change and save society going forward. So in something like um, polar sheet melting and, and glaciers and so on, how do we study that? How, what is the actual ways in which we try to understand that process? Oh, I can take that. Um, yeah, so it's everything from boots on the ground uh, in Antarctica, probably one of the most underexplored continents you know, on, on our planet. Mm -hmm. It's, it's people at sea around, around the continent. Uh, it's using all different kinds of instrumentation from satellites to uh, underwater robots that we send to study the physical processes happening under ice. Um, it, it's really, I mean, there are, there's probably thousands of scientists studying the polar ice, the polar ice sheets. Uh, there probably should be thousands more. Um, the thing that's exciting is that we just continually are making exciting discoveries. I would, this is not a field that after 40 years is kind of like sleepy or dead. It is exciting. Yeah, I think the, uh, the ice sheets are, uh, I mean, understanding how they work, and we've got some great people at Lamont who do that, uh, is the first thing. And I guess that the, the, it goes back to what I'm saying about the science changing. Um, we used to think ice sheets were pretty stable and that they were such massive structures that they weren't going to be a major issue for a very long time. And increasingly people are worried about the mechanics of the way ice sheets are behaving and they're discovering uh, that actually they are in danger of collapsing much, much faster than people have thought. And so people are worried about sea level rise being 10 times faster than it is today. Uh, by the end of the century. So these kinds of things um, give people major cause for concern. Um, but I think the other problem, which um, is, adds to the complexity, is that sea level doesn't just um, go up and down with the ice sheets melting, or go, go up with, sea mice with the ice sheets melting. There are some interesting, fascinating, complex scientific features to this, which means that in places sea level goes down, and other places it goes up. So you need to understand all that. You need to get satellite data. There is a big new satellite uh, going up right now, which is going to measure this. And we'll be able to figure out, if we have the right people on the ground, what will actually happen around various coastal communities around the, the planet as that happens and how it will change in the future. So there's a lot of important but interesting science to be done there as well. So, um... So let's turn to Colombia. And uh, in one sense, one can think of Colombia as the, the sort of the place that recognition of climate change happened, right? I mean, is that fair, Wally Broker, with this famous uh, article? And that follows, of course, a very distinguished uh, tradition of, of uh, scientific and, um, well, scientific breakthroughs. Uh, explain why Colombia is, um, you know, so great when it comes to uh, issues like climate change. Alex, let's start with you. So I think the um, uh, first thing to realize, I think, is that the basic science of climate change has been around for over 100 years. And people have known that when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this will happen. Uh, at the same time, the detail of what that means has been less than clear. Uh, and it's very definitely the pioneering work of Wally Broker, but also many other scientists at Lamont. Also, Jim Hansen's work at NASA GIS. Uh, they played a leading role in actually getting people to not just recognize that we could be on the brink of an abrupt and uh, dr dramatic global warming, but also that um, this was something that would be catastrophic and extremely hard to solve as a problem. And the problem that I guess that we face is that um, we use carbon all the time. It's in everything we, we, we actually we manufacture with it. Steel is made with it. Cement is made with it. We're generating carbon in manufacturing. We're using carbon in our heating. So it's pretty much the whole of society has been driven down this path 
of using carbon and generating emissions in the process. And so to just suddenly say, you know, sorry, we've got to stop all this is immensely hard. It's not just a problem from the point of view of um, the technology to come up with alternatives, although Colombia has got some leading people particularly working on negative emissions and how to take carbon out of the atmosphere, but also in other aspects. Um, but it's also a, a sociological problem. It's a political problem. It's an ethical problem. Whose job is it to deal with this? And in, in fact, because in particular, the, the poorer parts of society are going to be more heavily impacted than those who are actually creating the problem. There are big dimensions here about how you make, you know, um, how do you actually bring about social justice in this situation? And that's one of the reasons why Colombia is very important. Colombia produces, A, it's got the breadth to deal with those problems, but B, it also produces more authorships to IPCC reports than any other university in the United States. We are incredibly engaged with actually trying to take our science and deliver, if you like, impact to address this major problem going forward. But we've also got wonderful people doing important policy work, wonderful people uh, engaged in working with communities around the world, helping them to understand what they need to do to adapt, and people working with technology companies to get them to think about it, people working in business to get them to think about it. So Colombia's got a great, if you like, um, set of cards to play from the point of view of the way it engages with the world more generally, but specifically about climate and energy and solutions going forward. So, uh, Maureen, uh, just on the subject, I want to get to the uh, new school of climate change in a second, but uh, just on what Colombia brings to the problem intellectually, academically, scientifically, and so on today, as of today. Yeah, well, uh, Colombia has been a powerhouse in studying climate change for half a century. I mean, it's why I came to Colombia as a grad student in the 80s. Um, and I agree with everything Alex says there. And the, I think the other incredible strength of Columbia University is its student body. And one thing that's really struck me as we've learned more and more about climate change, at the very same time, more and more people are being impacted by the negative impacts of climate change. Extreme events, heat waves, drought, floods, nuisance flooding from sea level rise. And one of the things that really impresses me about our student body, our graduate student body, is how committed they have become to understanding and all, in, you know, in addition to being in a lab with their million dollar instrument, also trying to understand and promote an understanding of the intersectionality between climate justice, uh, the impacts of climate change, how those impacts are being felt by society, um, as well as the science. And, you know, it's increasingly becoming impossible, as Alex said, to separate these issues of of you know, just environmental, uh, de you know, environmental negative environmental impacts and how they are felt unevenly across society. So um, we have decided it'll be announced. Uh, I will announce this on on Thursday uh, that Columbia is going to establish a school on climate change, the Columbia School of Climate Change. Universities change over time. New disciplines arise, new research arise, arises. Uh, I mean, this is part of the nature of academic work. Uh, we feel like uh, there's a whole new set of problems that need to be solved. Sometimes we create interdisciplinary institutes, sometimes we fund centers, sometimes we uh, allow faculty to move in these directions, but sometimes we create a school. And that's a very dramatic thing for a university to do. So a hundred years ago, people thought that dealing with public health issues was extremely important and we needed a separate school in order to do that. We have now decided after a year of thinking about this and a task force led by Alex, 
that Columbia should create the first school of climate change in the United States. And we're about to do that. The trustees have approved it. Um, what is a school? A school is the opportunity to hire faculty and award tenure. A school is the opportunity to build a student body and to have degrees that are specific to that. A school is an opportunity to establish a community of, of students and teachers, researchers, scholars, who were devoted to uh, a particular uh, area of human problems or of knowledge. Could each of you um, sort of explain why this is an important step? Maureen, I'm particularly struck by something you said earlier that I, every time I listen to um, people from Lamont Doherty, I, I think of this. Uh, you said that understanding the melt, understanding glaciers and so on is extremely important to dealing with climate change. We have thousands doing this, but we could use thousands more. Mm -hmm. How do uh, think about the school in terms of mobilizing more intellectual resources to deal with issues of climate change? What more can we do through a school? Yeah, well, th it's absolutely true. The, it's, you know, the more you learn about the climate change problem, the more you realize what you don't know. But, you know, I will always uh, advocate for more scientists, but I really think the school's unique contribution is going to be building bridges between the scientific community um, and all the other disciplines that now have to work together to solve this incredibly complex problem. So, and, and you know, I, I guess this relates to the fourth purpose as well, which hopefully we can talk about. But, you know, if you just think about sea level rise, we need to talk, I'm talking, we need to talk to communities who are trying to figure out how to invest limited funds they may have in dealing with sea level rise. You have to talk to uh, the lawyers and, and the people thinking about governance and thinking about how do you change laws and regulation to deal with the fact that land is disappearing sometimes even all whole countries are at risk of disappearing. Um, how, how do you deal with increasing disasters uh, due to sea level rise that are exacerbating storm surges and the impacts of hurricanes? And so all these things are all tied together now. And, 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 they, and again, they require this deep breadth of knowledge and understanding that is far broader than what any one person would be trained coming up through an academic system. So I really look forward. Uh, I, I think it's an incredible idea. I think it's incredibly exciting. And I think it's just, again, going to allow us to do so much more than we could do individually Thanks as a department. Me. So Alex, um, weigh in on this, of course, uh, as you, um, you know, we've worked on, we talked about this for a year, year and a half. It's now going to be a reality. Uh, we have a spectacular anonymous $50 million gift uh, to support the beginning of uh, this school. Um, it fits into a move uh, that Columbia is making to try to be more systematically engaged with real problems, not only to do great research, which of course is our uh, primary purpose along with teaching, but a new purpose of, of embracing the idea that universities in Columbia in particular should be working with outside partners to bring academic work to bear on real problems. And so the Climate School is a, is a prime um, new example of a university trying to, to do this, put this in your own words about how important it is. Well, I think the, um, the first thing to say is that I think it's, um, you know, School universities tend to be places that you think of as solid and permanent and things are a little bit slow to change there and and people hark back to their days of university and, and with fondness and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and actually um, universities really should be dynamic places where things change to deal with the problems society needs to address. And it's not just from the point of view of being relevant and uh, important. It's also from the point of view of having interesting new things to work on. And so the, the role of a university is to do things that are interesting. Uh, we need to educate and about the most interesting things so that 
young scholars learn these exciting things, uh, but also we need to engage in deep scholarly research in a way that is totally unbiased and that actually pushes society, helps to push society forward in terms of providing a framework for them with which to consider the problem. And the rather like uh, Mo was saying, Maureen was saying, um, you know, the, the Ebola crisis wasn't solved just by coming up with a vaccine. Uh, it was solved by social anthropology as well, and people understanding what was happening on the ground to communities, etc. And it's a bit the same with climate change. We're not going to we're not going to solve this problem just with the science. We've got great science already. We've got brilliant technology. People can see pathways. What they're struck by is the slowness with which society actually really does make take the necessary steps to actually make those changes. And so that's where you realize you need people who understand decision making, people who understand business, people who understand uh, politics, law, the ethics of this uh, problem, and what are the human rights around climate change. So a number of these subjects, even though they are things we can talk about at some level, um, one gets the feeling that actually they could become major disciplines in the future. And universities need to be thinking about not just what they're doing right now and how to do it better, but what are going to be the important topics for the future of society in 10, 20 years' time? Which, um, what kind of training will uh, students really need to really help take society forward in their various um, lines of work uh, and employment and as citizens in society? And so a climate school brings the focus down to what is the biggest challenge we are facing in society, our biggest long-term challenge. And we have to address this uh, and we have to be prepared for it. And we've got to build resiliency. We've got to find ways to slow it down. Uh, and we've also got to think about it in the context of an ethical society that needs to develop over the coming decades as the crisis worsens. And so this is the big prize of the school, I think. And I suspect, you know, I think it's great to be first, but the fact is I really hope we are emulated um, hook, line and sinker by many other uh, institutions worldwide, as I believe we will be, uh, because people will recognize this has to be the key focus for many scholars working in universities around the world. I mean, we certainly see this now with the pandemic. So, um, you know, uh, again, a hundred more or less years ago, uh, people didn't think of uh, having a, a school of public health. Now we can imagine the world without having schools of public health. And, uh, you know, the, the benefits of universities collectively moving in a direction uh, to take up research on major problems is, a, you know, it's a key part of American America's success. And as you say, we hope that we will be the first, but not by any means the last, uh, that, uh, you know, 10, 20 years from now, every university will have a school of climate change in one form or another, and will mobilize more intellectual resources towards uh, dealing with this problem, these problems. Uh, let me take a last question be before we move on to uh, Mark and audience questions. Uh, every time one has a conversation about climate change and, and what needs to be done, uh, at some point the conversation will say, you know, it's really all about China. Um, because China is where the bulk of the um, uh, emissions are now and, and they have to deal with this. So we are in a very fraught period with thinking about China. I mean, the United States and China, uh, you know, put aside current politics, but um, you know, there are serious issues of, of how these two countries, these two nations are going to evolve. If climate change is such a crucial problem and it's extremely uh, tied to the development of China, I think the intellectual ties that we develop uh, through something like the climate school, but also generally um, uh, need to be strong. And I wonder what you're thinking how we should be building greater intellectual connections and ties uh, with China. Hmm. Shall I dive in? Sure. Um, bet. So basically, I think it, this is a global problem. I think it's um, 
it was a major step forward when the US and China uh, agreed to both work on climate change together, uh, which happened under the previous administration. And uh, that set the way for the really important um, agreement to actually limit greenhouse gas emissions globally. Because without China and the United States, uh, then you are seriously limited. So cooperation between these two nations is absolutely crucial. Now, the other thing that's important about China is that, uh, from, from my perspective, is that while they have been um, incredibly um, successful in terms of expansion of their economy, industrialization, uh, and they're consuming uh, um, and also creating uh, huge amounts of new wealth effectively, um, there's also the issue that they are um, both generating greenhouse gases, but also looking at new ways of doing energy in a way that is less harmful to the environment. So they've been pioneering in terms of not just the science, but also perhaps more importantly, how to scale up the technology. And this has brought down the cost of many alternatives, in particular solar. Um, and so the net result has been very positive that they bring a, they bring a, a scale to the whole issue that if, you, if they are on board, then they can actually make it easier for the rest of the world to move in a certain direction. They've been also doing the same thing with nuclear. They've actually been investing hugely in nuclear in a way that um, America and Europe has pretty much given up on. And they are doing the innovative development on a scale that nobody else has actually been able to achieve or match. And that is potentially really important. They're also building coal-fired power stations in places in other countries as part of their supportive um, economic development of the rest of the world. And so the question, I guess, is to what extent they are driven by the uh, real concerns for the planet and to what extent they're concerned about the pollution problems that have been arising in China itself. And so you want to, we want to use everything we can to move that dialogue in one particular direction, of course, um, with uh, engagement. And Maureen, do you, do you feel that we have strong intellectual ties with the academic communities in China? Does Lamont have? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm, I think I'm thinking two things from your question. One is that geologists or scientists as a group tend to have really broad uh, collaborations that are international in nature because of the global nature of our field areas. You know, when I, when I just went out to sea last year, I was with people from 20 different nations on a ship. Uh, you know, there are people at Lamont who've been doing field work in China for decades. Uh, I have a PhD student that just defended his PhD in China uh, that spent three years in my lab. Um, so, you know, those those relationships have been incredibly strong uh, and long lasting. Um, but one thing I think about when people talk about China and their emissions, which are the highest annually right now, is that so much of those emissions are also our emissions. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you just look around you, anyone, you will probably see many different items that came from China that are in your home. So we really do have to think about this problem collectively and partner in solving it. Yeah. And lastly, our colleague of Real Haynes, who's in the Columbia World Projects, um, was recently appointed by Biden to be on the uh, transition team to think about foreign policy. And uh, from day one, if Biden is elected, what to do. I assume both of you would say on day one, we join the Paris Climate Agreement. Yes. Absolutely. Well, fortunately, it was arranged so that the um, we wouldn't actually be necessarily dropping out until this presidency had finished. Right. Uh, after this presidency had finished. So that was quite um, judicious in terms of the way it was set up. And uh, um, that absolutely needs to be a key part of this. Key part of this. Yeah. Mark, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, let's go right into some questions from the audience. Uh, George David, who's very involved in climate at Columbia, asked the following question. This is really for Dr. Ramo. Dr. Ramo, talk to us about negative emissions, negative emissions, and what Lamont is doing in that field. 
Yeah, that's that, you know, so scientists in, in general and in the physical side of climate change think that not only do we have to radically reduce emissions, but we also have to actively remove some of the CO2 that we've already put in the atmosphere. So there are a number of groups at Le Mans, uh, that have been working on different methods to do this, including uh, trying to understand the basic physics and chemistry of injecting CO2 into rocks, especially in hot hydrothermal areas, uh, such as Iceland, and have had some incredibly uh, successful experiments there. Um, also uh, working on ways to create, uh, to accelerate the chemical weathering of rocks that will absorb CO2, uh, working on ways to physically remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, so this is a very active area of research, uh, which all fundamentally comes down to the science of, of rock gas interactions. We have a question from uh, one of our audience members that's more alive, and she writes, What's the most credible global climate change? What are the most credible global climate change models right now? Is the IPC one of them? And how would you think about the models that we're currently seeing and what you think they're likely to uh, be in reality? Do you want to take that, Alex? Um, sure, I can try. The, um, I mean, basically, there are several models that have been put out there. Um, so these aren't these are um, not the data collection that I was talking about where we measure global temperatures, but actually predicting what will happen in the future. And so the different models make different assumptions about what that will look like. Um, the um, one of the models is the NASA GIS model, which is basic Columbia. Um, that model uh, is particularly strong in certain areas, but the degree to which we bring in, you know, different bits of the climate system means that some of them are, are more, um, more powerful than others. So typically the models are used by different groups to address a particular problem. It's like they say, well, what will happen to water in a particular area under certain conditions going forward? And they take a look at that and see what that's going to be like. Um, the most interesting modeling that's going on right now I think that actually is taking us into a new uh, dimension is to look at um, ways in which we can look at the, the granularity of the climate system in more detail. So the reason why this is important is because, as I said, some bits of climate we just don't understand. So we don't understand clouds very well, and they have a huge impact on what will actually happen in terms of uh, the, the degree of warming that takes place. Uh, it also, of course, they affect the degree of precipitation and rainfall in different areas. And we found it very, very hard to predict rainfall over the years. And so there's been uncertainty about how different parts of the world be, will be impacted. So one of the things people have started doing is using uh, AI, artificial intelligence, to try and uh, move to much, much higher resolution modeling, but also go to uh, new areas of computer space, if you like, to actually think about new kinds of solutions that hadn't been considered before to explore these different uh, possibilities. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes on that uh, here in engineering, in the school, engineering school in that particular area, uh, as well as at Lamont. There's also a great deal of work going on in other universities trying to take those models forward. Um, ultimately, again, New York is pretty well served because we not only have Columbia we've, and NASA GIS, we've also got uh, Princeton, just down the road, which is a fantastic geophysical fluid dynamics lab, and they are developing a lot of exciting models as well. So there's every reason to build this, if you like, um, science ecosystem here at Columbia and in New York for those reasons. Peter Joseph asks, uh, would you comment on the House Select Committee just came out with a new report on the climate crisis that just recently came out. Are any of you up to date on, on what that report is telling us? Um, I did read a briefing document about that yesterday. Uh, the Select Committee on Climate Crisis, was that the one? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so they're recommending that Congress put a price on, on carbon, and they say that car a carbon price would percolate through the economy, the entire economy, and provide an incentive for decision makers to look for ways to reduce emissions. Um, there's also a, a green act was introduced that would provide federal tax incentives to promote clean energy technologies 
And then the Growing Climate Solutions Act was also recently uh, introduced. And this is bipartisan act. And actually this harkens back to the CO2 removal question. Uh, this would be legislation that would help climate smart farming methods that hopefully would sequester more carbon than it releases. So a series of actions that might might take place, unlikely to take place now, might take place in the future if, if yeah. there's more momentum behind them. Yep, the Climate Solutions Act is bipartisan. Great, great. Um, ben Jankowski asks about population. His point is that population is set at some point in the not too distant future to plateau and then potentially go down. How will the climate uh, crisis be alleviated or ameliorated by that? Uh, by that change, if at all. Um, shall I tackle that? The, I mean, basically, the population is set to grow to about 11 billion for the global population, and then it's meant to plateau out of around that number. There are different estimates. Some people think it will get there a bit faster and plateau at a lower number. Um, but those are the sorts of numbers, 10 billion, 11 billion that people have been considering. Um, the this growing population, we're now at about 7 billion. Um, this growing population, of course, um, is partly to do with people living longer lives, uh, largely to do with living longer lives, uh, because they've got better standards of living, which of course is fantastic, that's great. Um, the net result is, of course, they're gonna consume more um, as temperatures rise, uh, on the earth, they're going to need more air conditioning. They're all going to want to buy cars. Um, they're going to want to think about um, probably eating uh, food that actually might actually uh, be worse in terms of CO2 and methane emissions for the atmosphere. And so there's no question that the population growth is going to have a very, it's going to be very challenging. Uh, at a time when uh, climate change is potentially impacting our ability to grow food. And so the, the droughts that I talked about earlier are gonna be impacting our ability to do agriculture in certain places. Um, the changes that are taking place in the ocean are gonna be affecting the food chains in the ocean. And in principle, we are gonna be seeing uh, the collapse of certain food chains and possibly therefore collapse of certain fisheries. And so I think we've got to worry a lot about how we're going to feed this population going forward between now and 2100. Um, there are, of course, very exciting, innovative alternatives being looked at. And land use is one of the most important things to focus on in terms of changing agriculture to deal with this. But once people, once the number of people does plateau and uh, we do see maybe a decline in the population, uh, then uh, all other things being equal, that should be good, one would think, for um, emissions going forward. A couple of questions about Colombia. Younger people have led the way on climate change, asks our questioner, who didn't, I don't have a name here. How are Colombia students involved in the climate crisis and what leadership do you see from them? And then I'll add one other question that's also directly related to Colombia. We're building a new campus. How is the new Manhattanville campus being built vis-a-vis -vis climate? So, uh, oh, sure. I'd be happy to talk, talk about, about the students because quite literally they are the reason I have hope and optimism for the future. And it's another reason why I think building a climate school is so amazing because we are going to be educating the future leaders and they want, they want that education. And, um, you know, again, on our campus, it's been uh, really, when I, when I think about uh, the students, uh, what they are doing, they are in their labs, they're doing cutting edge work, publishing in the top journals, and then on the weekends, they're going out and they're marching in, uh, they're marching for science, they're marching for environmental justice, and they, they know, they see that what is happening now is gonna determine, you know, the problems that they are dealing with in society and in their lives uh, in the decades to come. And, and they're not sitting around waiting for this to happen. They, they are out there and they are uh, educating us and organizing and uh, it's a great thing to see in my opinion. Yeah, so this is quite a, a legacy issue. So there's no question that in terms of uh, fairness, um, 
climate stands out as, as one of the, if not the biggest, if you like, intergenerational ethical issues that we face, uh, that we are going to be, through our actions, are basically badly impacting society. And uh, in many respects, um, we are going to be, it's, it's those younger generations that are going to be suffering most. So I think there's a big issue for us from the point of view of listening to what young people mm -hmm. say and empowering them uh, in terms of them feeling they can actually do something. So discussions around the climate um, school um, last year in the fall uh, uh, were brilliant, partly because we went into every school of Columbia and talked with them about it what we were doing and what we were interested in, and getting their opinions, um, partly because we got data from around the university to realize how massive Columbia's footprint was in the area of climate research and education, but also because we engaged with the students and the young people were, we did town halls for students, we do two, two town halls uh, downtown to talk to students about, um, listen to what they were wanting to tell us about and of course, a lot of them are, if you like, activists. They're quite keen to see something done about whether it's to do with divestment or whether it's to do with the carbon footprint or waste or whatever it is in the university. Um, but one of these um, students was involved in Extinction Rebellion and was quite concerned, in fact, was one of the demonstrators at a previous demonstration at Columbia. Uh, and I said I'd be happy to talk to him afterwards and so he came to see me and we talked about what he could do and and you know what I said was well why don't we actually think about getting you involved in helping to design this climate school so that's the opportunity I think I think there's an opportunity for us to think about the climate school as being something that young people can really engage with not just from the point of view of taking classes but actually running their own classes at some level in you know developing their own seminar programs and helping to think about what it is they think we need to do for the future so there are lots of opportunities there just to get back to the other part of your question about Manhattanville hey um, Alex let me interrupt you for one second you know Lee many years ago we talked about Manhattanville and your vision for Manhattanville talk, talk to us a little bit about that vision how has it played out and how do you see climate and the buildings related to that so I, um, I believe that universities are uh, really have to expand constantly. I mean, it's just the nature of knowledge it takes 10 people to try to understand what we have just discovered that we uh, only needed, you know, five, four uh, a year ago. I mean, that kind of growth is just the history of American and universities generally, great universities. Columbia had this terrible problem that uh, for a couple of decades, it really was constricted uh, for a variety of reasons in its ability to expand. So my belief was we really needed a new campus that would extend out many decades and would give the intellectual life of the place opportunities to grow and expand. Manhattanville became that, that place. Well, if we now look at climate change as one of the dominant intellectual new areas, um, I mean, old and new, um, it will define Manhattanville. The business school, which will uh, move there from Central Campus in two years, uh, Costis, the new dean and the faculty really want to take up climate change as a key theme for, for the business school. Uh, the School of the Arts, which is now in Manhattanville, feels this way. Um, we have a site uh, we have reserved, I have reserved four, uh, the School of Climate Change to, uh, to, you know, build up. And then we have Columbia World Projects, which is this effort to try to provide the university with a structured way uh, to grapple with problems. And sure enough, one of the first problems that they take up, uh, bringing academic work to bear, is from uh, Lamont and, and working on short-term modeling, uh, climate change modeling and countries and departments of agriculture and farming. Uh, we have a, a project potentially on negative admissions that uh, both Alex and Marie know about well. So uh, everything about Manhattanville is uh, leading to an opportunity for the university to adjust intellectually to problems like climate change. And then lastly, just as the new campus itself, it's very responsive to uh, not only the design, modern design sensibilities of uh, the day, open campus, no gates, et cetera, 
integrated into Harlem and the surrounding communities, but also, uh, you know, recognized as the most green sensitive, friendly uh, campus in the United States. So it's an opportunity in every, every dimension. There's been a question asked uh, that wants to uh, bring us back to models for a minute. If we look at the paper today, we're constantly seeing articles about Siberia and about the temperatures there and the temperature in general in uh, some of the coldest areas of the, of the world now with temperatures in some cases over 100 degrees. What does this tell us about, about models? Does it tell us that the models expect this to happen, this incredibly high temperature, variant temperature, or, or do you, are you surprised by this? Maureen, this gets back to a question that you asked earlier about the melting of, of ice sheets and by implication permafrost. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, the temperatures in the Arctic set an all time high last Saturday. The temperature was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in a town in Siberia that was previously been known as the coldest place on earth to live. So, um, but the thing is, I'd like to, say something about the models. The IPCC itself doesn't have a model. The IPCC kind of uh, surveys models and, and evaluates them for, you know, how well they agree or disagree, where are the biggest uncertainties in models coming from. And the modeling community itself is incredibly dedicated to trying to understand how good their models work and why they agree and disagree. And there's a lot of MIP projects, model intercomparison projects. Um, but what we, were, what we are seeing, the increasing numbers of extreme events on the warm side is completely in agreement with what models have been predicting for quite a bit, quite a long time. Um, so if anything, if I took a kind of holistic 40 year view over my career, models used to be more conservative in, t in predicting the rate at which climate change would occur. And as we've come to learn about the physics and chemistry of the system and understand how responsive they are to the changing atmospheric chemistry of greenhouse gases, the models are predicting uh, larger and more rapid changes, um, you know, literally in agreement with what we're observing. You know, Alex, I wonder, I, I'm not sure that we provided full context for what Columbia brings to climate. So, for example, we start a school, but what does that mean? One of the things that, that it's possible our, our uh, colleagues and friends on the, on the uh, Zoom call don't fully understand is how many people are at the Earth Institute? What will it mean for climate? How many people are studying climate in its fullness at Columbia today? Give us some sense of the context for that, please. So I think the, um, we've got about, uh, the Earth Institute is, is immensely important, not just because it was the first of its kind, but it's also big. It's got 700 academics and researchers and staff across Columbia. Um, and it's done a lot of a trailblazing work in terms of sustainability education over, the many, over many years. Um, so that gives you a scale that most universities can't achieve. And part of that is because of the size of the Lamont Body Earth Observatory, which is the biggest geosciences organization in any university globally. Um, but it's also because we've, got a, we've actually discovered that we've got climate work going on across Colombia. So the Earth Institute, um, through our consultation this fall, uh, you know, I realized that actually the Earth Institute is an understatement of just how big we are in working on climate. And we, the number looks like when we added up, we asked each school to give us details of who they had working, how many researchers, et cetera. And we added it up and it's close to a thousand people across Columbia, plus students working on research, uh, doing research that's related to- A thousand academics. Academics, researchers, you know, um, you know research fellows in some cases, postdocs, et cetera. But it's, it's actually a, a big, big team of people, sometimes research associates. Uh, and research support staff as well. So it's actually a, a, a very big enterprise and it's spread across subjects as diverse as journalism, social work, history, you know, even the history departments say they could quite happily recruit faculty who are interested in the, the relationship between climate change and how it's impacted history. So there's lots of interest across there, lots of strength 
uh, to build upon. And I think this is going to be an incredibly important part of what we have to deliver. The other thing is just to go back a little bit to what, um, uh, what you were talking about earlier, um, the, the bill that's just been passed. You know, Columbia, through the Center for Global Energy Policy, does a huge amount of work working in a bipartisan way with the uh, congressmen and actually trying to engage them on the issues of climate change, sustainability. And of course, what you realize is when you talk with them candidly and openly, um, or maybe privately, uh, what you actually do is to realize they, there's large agreement uh, across uh, society. There's lots of agreement across uh, different states and cities about what needs to be done to tackle this problem. And so, um, you know, one of the things that was put together as a result of CJEC working with people uh, is this idea of a carbon tax. Of course, the first time when it went through, when they tried to put it through uh, as a Republican motion, it didn't get anywhere. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's now gaining traction and eventually people will look back and say, that was a great idea. And that's the way government moves and that's the influence Colombia can have in terms of really changing uh, what gets done in the United States of America. You're here to that. Lee, over to you or do you like me to wrap up? Um, I'm good. I thank you all of you for doing this and uh, Mark, uh, thank you and um, you're, anyway. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. You know, I guess one of the things for me that when you're affiliated with an institution, you always have to be asking, are they going from strength to strength? You know, we know that Columbia has strength in climate. I'm not gonna repeat the story. Hopefully we've conveyed that. We have scale, we have strength. But the key thing is we're not resting on our laurels. We're looking at it and saying, what's the next thing that needs to be done for this institution to lead the most important problem humanity faces today? What is the thing we need to do? And the thing that leads through Lee's leadership, through recruiting Alex, through a bold vision, we've decided the thing to do is to create a school that connects through every aspect of the university's life, some of which we didn't even mention today. CEPA, architecture, so many areas that the, the energy center, there's so many pockets that connect to this issue. And so if you wanna get involved in that, we'd welcome it. Uh, please, I hope you do. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much.